September 11th, 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 September 11th. September 11th. September 11th. September the 11th. September the 11th. Evil killers. Taliban. Al Qaeda. Osama bin Laden. War and danger. Weapons of mass destruction. Terror. 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 Terrorism. 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 Global terrorism. Global terrorism. World terrorism. Global terrorism. Global terrorism. Global terrorism. Global terrorism the terrorist 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 the evil terrorists terrorism the words are hypnotically repeated terrorism terrorist terrorist threat and of course believed to be linked to al-qaeda but it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? The entire U.S. ruling class, ruling elite, comes to see terrorism as the preferred means, indeed the only means, to provide social cohesion, to provide an enemy image for the society to keep it together. According to neocon theory from Carl Schmitt, you have to have an enemy image in order to have a society. A very dangerous thing because now it means that the entire social order, the political parties, intellectual life, politics in general, all based on a monstrous myth. Monstrous myth. So there was no network? No. No? Probably not. We invented it. Invention's too strong a term. I think we projected it. Um, we projected our own worst fears. And that what we see is a fantasy that's being created. Al-Qaeda is a global network with global reach. To target a deadly web of terror. The idea, which is critical to the FBI's uh, prosecution, that bin Laden ran a coherent organization with operatives and cells all around the world, of which you could be a member, is a myth. There is no Al-Qaeda organization. There is no international network with a leader, with cadres who will unquestioningly obey orders, uh, with tentacles that stretch out to sleeper cells in America, in Africa, in Europe. Um, that idea of a coherent, structured, terrorist network with an organized capability simply does not exist. And there are, there are several key mind manipulation techniques which um, are very, very powerful uh, propaganda tools. The most effective and the most powerful, and it's used on us all the time, is something I call problem reaction solution. It's a cracker, this one. It's a mind manipulation technique that avoids not only opposition to what is the goal of the manipulators, it actually manipulates people to demand they do what they want to do anyway. And it's happening all the time. I, once you see this technique and how it works, you watch the news and read the newspapers in a completely different light because you start to see it happening. It works like this. You start by secretly creating a problem in the world and making sure someone else is blamed for it in the public uh, arena, in the public mind. It could be a run on a currency, it could be a government collapse. At its most extreme, it could be a war. Because the two world wars in this century were funded, all sides were funded by the same people. Provable. The same people that funded the Allies in the Second World War and funded... Uh, the Soviet Union also funded 
Hitler. Why would they do that? Why would someone want to fund all sides in a war? What is good is a war? Well, first of all, on one level, it makes vast amounts of money if you're lending money to all sides and you're also um, selling them lots of arms and all that stuff. But the fundamental reason for a war is to change the nature of post-war society. And what we saw in the First World War and the Second World War were massive global examples of problem-reaction-solution, which worked like this. The problems created secretly. You then use the media, which isn't difficult, to wind up public opinion in relation to your manufactured problem to the point where public opinion utters the classic words, something must be done, this can't go on, which is always, always followed by, give my power away, what are they going to do about it? And at that point, those who created the problem and got someone else to be blamed for it, wound up that public reaction, then openly, in the public arena, in the parliaments of the world, uh, on the, in the newspapers and on the television, offer the solutions to the problems they have created. And in doing so, they get vast numbers of people to demand what they want to do anyway. Uh, for instance, if, um, if you want more cameras in the streets. Crikey, they're going up all over the place in Britain. If you want more cameras in the streets, you want a more armed police force, you want more authoritarian laws, greater erosions of freedom, and you want the public to demand you do it, then get the public frightened of crime. Either let um, society break down so there is more crime, or emphasize crime to be worse than it really is in some areas, Get people frightened, and the first thing people do when they're in fear about something is they look for someone out there to protect them from what they're frightened of. So, get people frightened that they're going to be burgled, get people frightened they're going to be mugged in the street, and they'll demand you take the freedoms away. They'll demand cameras in the streets and more authoritarian laws. Yeah, there is a war on freedom. And we're being told over and over and over again that we need to support George Bush and, and we have to support the war in Iraq and we have to support this war on terror and we have to support all these laws that are coming by because, of course, they're all here to protect us. And yet when you look at things like, in, like the Patriot Act, this allows the FBI or any law enforcement agency to utilize what they call sneak and peek. They can go into your house when you're not home and they can go through all of your stuff and without your ever knowing about it. How is this protecting your rights? That's just one example where we get to think we're free. You know, on the patriotic holidays, we all break out our flags and, and we wave them around and we sing patriotic songs like, I'm proud to be an American, or I get to think I'm free. We have a program known as Echelon, uh, where they listen to every telephone call, every email, record every fax here in the United States. And all of this is done by computers. All of these messages are kept indefinitely on computer disks. What the American people must understand is that the massive amounts of money we're spending on defense is not to protect America, but ultimately to be used to control the American population as we move from freedom to fascism. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most brainwashed Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home. You can in turn be arrested with no charges revealed to you, detained indefinitely with no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured, all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. If you need a painted picture of what is happening in this country, let's recognize how history repeats itself. In February 1933, Hitler staged a false flag attack, burning down his own German parliament building, the Reichstag, and blamed it on communist terrorists. Within the next few weeks, he passed the Enabling Act, which completely eradicated the German constitution, destroying people's liberties. He then led a series of preemptive wars, all justified to the German people as necessary to maintaining homeland security. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. 
To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the infamous Rockefeller banking and business dynasty. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas Rockefeller, Aaron eventually ended the relationship, appalled by what he had learned about the Rockefellers and their ambitions. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends, and um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and and out of that event, you're going to see, we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, they said, you're going to see guys going into caves looking for, <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he was laughing about the fact that you have this war on terror, there's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it because this is, a, this is an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And I said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean, you know, it's just that you keep talking about things. You keep saying it over and over and over again. And eventually people believe it. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror. And now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie. And now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's all one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now I would say, that, why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, What's the ultimate, what are the ultimate goals here? He said, the ultimate, the, goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the, with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off that chip. Just turn off that chip. This manipulation, and has been for a very long time, is to get the world population, or that majority of it anyway, to see as a good idea or the only option in given circumstances, circumstances that are manipulated into place, the creation of a one world government to which nation states would be principalities, administrative units, a world central bank which would administer all financial transactions on the planet, a world currency which wouldn't be coins and notes, it would be merely electronic, cashless society, for which there are fundamental implications for freedom, as we'll see as we go along tonight. A world army under centralized control, with nation-state uh, armies uh, dismantled under the uh, justification of seeking peace, and a microchipped population linked to a global computer, the latter of which sounds bizarre to many people on first hearing, except that we are ridiculously close to it and the technology already exists. That's right, microchipped. In 2005, Congress, under the pretense of immigration control and the so-called war on terrorism, passed the Real ID Act, under which it is projected by May 2008, you will be required to carry around a federal identification card, which includes on it a scannable barcode with your personal information. However, this barcode is only an intermediary step before the card is equipped with a Verichip RFID tracking module, which will use radio frequencies to track your every move on the planet. If this sounds foreign to you, please note that the RFID tracking chip is already in all new American passports. And the final step is the implanted chip, which many people have already been manipulated into accepting under different pretenses. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. In the end, everybody will be locked into a monitored control grid where every single action you perform is documented. And if you get out of line, they can just turn off your chip. For at that point in time, every single aspect of society 
will revolve around interactions with the chips. This is the picture that is painted for the future if you open your eyes to see it. A centralized one world economy where everyone's moves and everyone's transactions are tracked and monitored, all rights removed. Something has to change though. They have to find a better way to identify the bad guys or the rest of us are going to stay home and watch the world go by on television. But we need some system for permanently identifying safe people. Most of us are never going to blow anything up and there's got to be something better than one of these photo IDs, a tattoo somewhere maybe. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. If we don't do something, people are going to stop flying. If they stop flying, and I don't go to the Giants games, it means the bastards have won. Yeah, we're not going to let you win, buddy. We saw what you just implied. We're with Al-Qaeda if we don't take the microchip. Do you know how to keep your children safe? We'll tell you tonight. In the next year, you'll be able to use your teen's cell phone to locate them 24-7. Younger children will get a small global positioning device hidden in their wristwatch or backpack. And just around the next high-tech corner, an electronic chip like this that can be implanted under your kid's skin. Let's say children in your community start wearing wristwatches with GPS devices in them. Can't that only be a good thing for the community if it keeps children safe? I would love that. I mean, what's a parent's fear? I think it's a parent's obligation to ensure that their children have a chance to mature, to grow, to realize their potential. If it means it's big brother, so be it. You got to do what you got to do to keep your kids safe. Civil libertarians, eat your hearts out. Civil libertarians, eat your hearts out. All right, we got the Van Dams. We got this little girl, Elizabeth Smart. We got this girl in Pennsylvania. Uh, we got uh, Samantha Runyon. One after, we got this other little girl, one after another, after another, after another, after another. And parents around America saying, we can't even allow our kids to play in the front yard. Is there anything, technologically speaking, that they can do that could help in a situation like a kidnapping? Is there, for example, a microchip, a watch, a tracking device we can use for our kids? We are working on a product that we have called internally a PLD. PLD stands for Personal Locating Device which is an implantable GPS for which our company owns a patent and can be implanted surgically in the clavicle area of a child or someone that you are interested in tracking. It is an impl the first implantable microchip for humans that has multiple security, financial, and healthcare applications. One thing I would just suggest, I'm just an outside soon-to-be investor. I love this idea, by the way, Scott. I think there's a great... Thank you, Sean. Put it in earrings. Put it in a cross. Make it smaller, maybe not implantable, and I think let parents choose. It's not the government, I, so I like it. But we're currently working on those applications.